Okay, um, you know, today as Ming pointed out, right, it's the start of a, a brand new series, okay, which I'm, uh, I've, um, um, I'll be talking about uh, in the next uh, four months um, on Singaporean art. Um, and there'll be four themes or tracks right, in this uh, series. Uh, painting, and then the next um, theme will be on uh, sculpture, and then uh, on contemporary ink painting, and we wrap it up with contemporary art. Right? So there'll be uh, one kind of uh, theme per month. Okay. And we're going to kick off with, uh, I suppose, an art form that all of us are familiar with, which is painting. And it's also an art form, I suppose, which uh, has dominated right, Singaporean art, you know, uh, for most part of the 20th century. Um, now, before, you know, I hope to have, um, you know, some discussion, right, uh, you know, either in the course of the lecture or towards the end, okay, because I suppose there are, there are you know, a couple of uh, debates now surrounding painting. For example, the question as to whether painting is dead, right, at least in Singapore. Okay, so, you know, perhaps, I'd like to hear your views as well, okay, on this uh, issue. Um, now, how many of you have, uh, okay, there was a recent uh, exhibition which has, you know, recently closed, right, at the uh, National Museum, okay, it's called A Change World, okay, that's an exhibition on uh, uh, painting in Singapore from the 1950s to the 1970s, it was a parallel event, okay, of the uh, uh, Singapore Biennale 2013. Okay, how, can I have a show of how many of you have uh, actually seen that show, the exhibition? Hmm, okay, not, not, too, not too bad, can be better, <laughs> right? Um, now for those who have seen that show, well, you know, you have seen, uh, I suppose, uh, quite a good show in terms of, I suppose, the works that have been shown, right? Because there were easily a couple of hundred works, okay, and many of them, uh, you know, uh, have been shown for the first time. Okay, and 1950s to 1970s was really the peak of Singaporean painting. Okay. And, um, but I suppose uh, one glaring omission from that show okay, um, is the absence of sculpture. Okay, as far as I, I recall, there were only two um, sculptural works in that show. Right? Not that there's a lack of a sculpture scene in Singapore. You know, in my next uh, talk, Right, I'm going to um, you know uh, uh, talk on the um, you know the, the theme of sculpture, right? But I suppose there's uh, there are not many sculptures I suppose in our own national collection, okay? At least those that have uh, they are they have predated 1970, okay? Many of them are actually with the families of art of the of the sculptors, right? Rather than in the national collection, okay? So I suppose we. Um, I mean, the National Gallery, you know, um, they are building up, they know that this is a gap in the collection and they have recognised that and they are, you know, building up this uh, aspect of their collection. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to take a chronological approach. Okay, I think that's the best way to talk about, right, the history of uh, Singaporean painting. Okay, because that will give you a kind of understanding, okay, as to how uh, Singaporean painting developed, right, over the years over the course of about, about a century or so. Right? I mean, compared to other um, you know, countries, right, the history of uh, painting here in Singapore right, is um, relatively short. Right? I mean, as you know, you know Singapore was a, a fishing village. Right? Um, I don't know whether these people painted, okay, but if they did, whether they painted on pottery or not, okay, we have no material evidence. Right? But compared to, let's say, a civilization like China, I mean, painting goes back, you know, thousands of years ago, right? In Europe, they have found evidence of painting in the caves, okay? But in Singapore, you know, the earliest evidence of painting that we have, okay, goes back, uh, I suppose, only to the 19th century. Okay, and um, now I slightly changed, uh, very slight changes, right, to, to, the, to my PowerPoint slide. So, uh, it, it, it might not correspond, you know, um, with, with what you have, okay, but more or less, I think generally, right, it should correspond, okay, to the printed version. Yes, and I think, you know, we, you know, the, 
one of the earliest uh, kind of evidence of painting in Singapore, okay, um, you know, can be seen in the works of uh, so-called artists, right, in the 19th century. Okay, and these artists were mainly, I would say, travelers, sojourners. Okay, uh, now when I when I mean travelers or sojourners, I mean they were here only for a short time. Okay, some of them were really travelers who just you know happened to pass by Singapore. Um, Others were, in fact, uh, officials of the East India Company, right? The East India Company. Um, you know, others were members of scientific and exploratory expeditions. Okay. Now, some of these artists were, of course, uh, professionals. Okay. For example, um, some of the French expeditions they have on board, okay, professional artists, okay, whose job was to record you know, the kind of, the, the landscape and the topography of Singapore, right? And um, some of the officials of the East India Company were also what you call surveyors, okay? Meaning like they were like land surveyors, right? They surveyed the land, they drew up maps, okay? So the sketches and drawings which they did, okay, was uh, more a kind of a form of uh, documentation, okay? Rather than, uh, you know, I would say an, an you know, artistic, you know, creations in, in that sense. Okay, but nonetheless, I, I think they, they, they are still important. I mean, they are an important record, okay, of early Singapore, right? And I'm not saying that they are without merit. In fact, uh, you know, some of, the, some of these works were quite outstanding as well. Okay, I'm going to start with uh, perhaps one of the most well-known, you know, um, figures in the in the 19th century, and that's J. T. Thompson, okay? And J. T. stands for John Turnbull Thompson. Now, John Turnbull Thom Thompson was, um, you know, he came to Singapore, you know, as, uh, you know, and he, um, he was, in fact, appointed what you call government surveyor at the age of about 21, okay? And his job was, uh, he acted both as a surveyor, that means, that's to say he, uh, he mapped out the town, okay, um, and, and you know, he, his other task was as an engineer, okay, so he also built bridges, right, uh, he also constructed buildings, okay, and he has left a legacy in Singapore. Now, anyone knows uh, which buildings in Singapore were, you know, done by the hands of J.T. Thompson? Sorry? Victoria Memorial Hall. I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay, correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe not. Okay, the Dalhousie Memorial. That's one. Okay, he also designed the steeple of the first version of St. Andrew's Cathedral. Right? And of course, you know, the road today, what you call Thompson Road, is named after him. Right? Okay, and um, so he was, uh, you know, he, he played an important role as well. Uh, you know, in, in, in uh, charting, okay, the, the landscape of Singapore, right? And he was an amateur painter, a self-taught painter, okay, and um, this is uh, one of his work, it's called the Padang, right? And uh, you can see how different, of course, the Padang was at that time. Um, okay, and you know, if you look at this painting, you'll, you'll see that, you know, it offers us a kind of a microcosmic view, I suppose, of uh, society in Singapore at that time. Okay, what's interesting is that, um, I don't know whether it's by, by chance or by, uh, you know, a conscious decision. Um, you can see that J.T. Thompson, I mean, you can see in this painting that, you know, um, the different ethnic groups have been represented. Uh, just notice, is it okay the slide or is it too, uh, is it too bright or, or should we off another light? Huh? Can we have, uh, is it okay to off the light? You think? Yeah, maybe, yeah, thanks. Okay, where was I? Yes, uh, thank you, I think it's better. Yeah, as I mentioned, you know, I mean, he, here you can see the, the you know, I don't know whether it's a case at that time, but you know, the Padang seemed to have been a, a, a place for recreation and leisure, right? You see people of uh, you know, different ethnic races, okay, going to the Padang, 
okay, having gatherings there, right, the Chinese. Um, you know, on the left, you have an, a kind of an Indian group there. On the foreground, I believe that's a kind of a Malay family. And of course, you know, the, the Westerners. Okay, the Westerners. And uh, I suppose it's also a ground where horse riding okay, took place. Okay. But what's interesting, as I said, when you look at these early paintings, right, is the kind of their value as, uh, as documentation of early Singapore. Right, so in the background, we, we see uh, several buildings. Okay, and we also see a hill there. Anyone recognize this hill? Of course, right, Fort Canning Hill. Okay, it's also known as Bukit Larangan or to the Malays, Forbidden Hill. Right, and the hill has, uh, was, was uh, quite uh, important historically. Okay, it was the, the you know, Raffles residence was, uh, was there in the hill and it became the subsequent residence of, uh, it became the residence of subsequent residents and governors of Singapore. Okay, and it was also, I believe, uh, the site where Malay rulers, even before Raffles, used, right, um, uh, to live, right, on the hill itself. Okay, so the hill, if you look at, you know, these early paintings, okay, somehow became a, a favourite focal point, okay, of, of painters. Okay, now another building is this, maybe it's not so easy to identify. Anyone knows, okay? Uh, you don't see it anymore, of course, but you see it in a different version. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, very good, St. Andrew's Church. Now, how do you know that? Is there a, is it just a guess? Oh, okay. <laughs> now, actually, that's the first version of St. Andrew's Cathedral. Right, the first version. Um, in fact, it was, uh, it was designed by G.D. Coleman, okay, another important uh, you know, personality in Singapore who also built roads and constructed buildings. Right? In fact, G.D. Coleman uh, uh, constructed the, the oldest church in Singapore, which is the Armenian Church. Right? And he designed the first St. Andrew's Church, you see there. Okay, but after a series of uh, lightning strikes, uh, which damaged the building, right, I think in the 1860s, the decision was taken to rebuild it. Right? So the form today that we see right, is actually the second version. Right, so here is a, a closer view. Right? Um, I mean, it's, it's still like part of the Padang. Okay, and here, you know, it gives you a closer view of, uh, of uh, Fort Canning, okay, as well as uh, St. Andrew's Cathedral, before even the steeple was built, all right? So later on, the steeple was, in fact, it was J.T. Thompson who designed the steeple, okay, for the church. But as I said, because of uh, lightning strikes, uh, which damaged the building, they decided to tear it down, okay, and build, right, the present um, uh, version. Now this, uh, this is a print, a French engraving, and uh, the quality itself is quite outstanding, right, in terms of its detail. I mean, the French were frequently, you know, passing by Singapore. As you know, you know, Singapore stands at the confluence of the east-west route, right? So they were part of the, the French, you know, um, expeditions, and uh, these were, were, were records. Okay, that, that were left as part of the, those expeditions. Now this is a painting by a little known painter. Okay, we don't know much about him. Um, I suppose he's an amateur painter, judging by the quality of the painting, right? H.E. Edgar. Okay, view from Government Hill. And Government Hill, again, is, uh, I suppose, is uh, the, the, the Fort Canning Hill. Okay, so, uh, frequently also, you know, Fort Canning Hill um, paintings also show, um, you know, the, the, the landscape of Singapore from Fort Canning Hill, right, like this particular one here. Now, this is early Singapore, you're talking about 1820s, and you can see that Singapore was still um, quite heavily wooded, okay, uh, with a rather hilly terrain, but you can also see the first signs of human encroachment as well, right. Now, talking about the quality of the painting, you'll notice that, well, you know, it's a bit distorted, um, a bit naive, right? So you could see that, well, you know, not all the paintings have that, you know, kind of um, artistic quality, 
Okay, so this obviously was a work done by a kind of an amateurish right, painter. Now one of the most remarkable records of um, early Singapore okay, can be seen in the works of uh, this uh, um, artist called Charles Dice. Okay, and in his uh, series of, uh, I believe, watercolour as well as ink and sepia drawings and sketches of early Singapore. And they are contained in this folio that is known as Sketches in the Straits. I think you can still get a book somewhere in museum shops, right? Sketches in the Straits. Um, and you can see that, you know, th this, this work is outstanding, right, in terms of its uh, clarity, its perspective, is detail, okay, and you can see that you know the artist here is trying to show, you know, buildings um, along the Singapore River, right? This was done in 1847, okay. So you can see that you know uh, Singapore town, you can, uh, you know, was emerging quite rapidly, okay, because of uh, partly because of the foresight of Raffles, okay, in mapping, right, um, Singapore. And then we move on to portraiture, right? And um, you know the 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 body of works relating to portraiture that we have uh, dates back mainly to the you know to the late nineteenth and I would say the early part of the twentieth century, right? And these portraits are normally uh, those of um, you know uh, uh, prominent people, British officials, I suppose, governors. Right, prominent personalities, including local prominent local personalities like uh, Sir Song Ong Siang. Right, um, and this is a painting done by Julius Wencher. Now, Julius Wencher was, uh, you know, I don't think you know any of you probably have heard of him, but he was a German um, painter. Okay, he and his wife uh, Tina Wencher, right, they came to Singapore in the 1930s. And um, you know, while here they actually held an exhibition, right? To well, at least the, the press thought it was a good show, you know, and it was reported in the press and all that, right? So, um, and his wife was a sculptress, right? She she sculpts, okay. And I think we have uh, one of her works here in Singapore. Um, okay. In any case, um, so here you have a portrait of Song Ong Siang. Right now, Song Wang Xiang was um, the first Chinese, okay, to be admitted to the local bar, if I'm not mistaken. Right, I mean he was really the, the first uh, Queen scholar, okay, to study law in the UK, okay. And after he finished his studies, he opened up his own uh, legal firm. Um, and he was also very active in the local Christian community. Right, he was you know considered to be a leader. Okay, of the local uh, Christian association. Now, this particular portrait um, actually follows uh, the convention that we see in the West. Um, you know, now be before I carry on, you know, I mean, th there have been writings that say that you know, the, the, many of these portraits lack artistic merit, which I tend to agree. Okay, but. Of course, there are a couple of uh, quite outstanding ones, right? So I'm going to show, right, two of these uh, portraits today. Um, as I mentioned, right, this portrait itself follows, uh, you know, convention. Okay, it shows, uh, you know, Sir Song Ong Siang. He was knighted later, right, seated. Okay, and portraits normally show, um, you know, the objects that surround the sitter. Okay, um, normally convey the status as well as the power and the occupation of the sitter. Right? So in this case, you can see that um, uh, Song Wang Xiang sits on a kind of a Chinese you know, design chair. Okay? Allusion to his ethnic roots, okay? his Chinese ethnic roots. Okay? And the books you see on the table, I'm not sure whether that red book there is a Bible. Okay? I mean, if it is, then you know, it, it's a reference to his own very strong Christian conviction. Okay, but I'm sure those other books there you see, okay, are law books. Okay, which again are, you know, an allusion to his occupation. Right. Okay, and you see him there, you know, seated. 
um, you know, with his, uh, with his medals, right? Um, again, you know, again, it's, it's, a, it's a portrait that I suppose intends to convey, right, the power and the status of the sitter. I don't know whether the carpet, right? I mean, he also, uh, he was also a pranakan, right? I'm not sure whether the, that carpet looks to have a pranakan motifs, I'm not so sure, right? No, I don't believe so unless uh, someone can correct me. Ang Siang, I don't think so, right? No, okay, it's not. No. And, you know, of course this portrait, right, I have to show it. <laughs> because it's, it's, uh, it's our national treasure. Okay, the portrait of Sir Frank Swettenham. Okay, who was the, I think the resident as well as the governor of the, uh, you know, the Strait Settlements. Okay, and um, I suppose it's a national treasure because, uh, I mean, it's, it's a work of artistic value as well, right? But it's also a work that was painted by John Singer Sargent. Okay, and John Singer Sargent at that time was considered to be the best portrait artist, right, of his time. Okay, and um, here again, you know, I think more so than the Song Ong Siang uh, uh, portrait, which I suppose in terms of his pose, you know, um, uh, Song Ong Siang seated down, you know, it's a lot more intimate, okay. But here, although um, Frank Swettenham, okay, um, seemed to pose in a rather informal way, I suppose, you know, with his uh, right hand uh, leaning against, uh, I suppose, a chair, okay, and his uh, left hand on his hip, okay, it's still a, a portrait that, I suppose, um, try to convey the power and the status of this British official. Okay, and the fact that he wears a sword, you know, I mean swords, you know, in portraiture, okay, were only actually reserved for aristocrats, right? So by having a sword there, right, uh, I suppose, you know, he's uh, kind of aspiring to be one as well, right? Um, and that, again, the things that surround the sitter also is very relevant. Okay, um, so we see here, um, he has, uh, you see a, a chair on the left, right, uh, uh, you know, a gilded chair, and then um, we see a kind of a Malay silk brocade covering the chair. Okay, and uh, what's distinctive also, if you look at the background, especially on the right, it's like a curtain, a canopy. Okay, that in, uh, in, in the convention of portraiture symbolizes power. Okay, and on the left, what we see is another very important object. It's part of a globe. Okay, it's uh, standing on a gilded uh, stand. And if you look carefully, it shows a segment. The globe itself shows a segment of the Federated Malay States. Right? So you can see that the objects here, you know, alludes, you know, is an allusion to right, Frank Swettenham's own role. Right, okay, and it's meant again to convey his uh, his status and power. Right, I mean he looks quite outstanding, right, in his uh, immaculate, right, white, you know, uh, kind of uniform. Okay. I believe this was shown uh, some time back, right, in that sh in one of the exhibitions as well in the National Museum. Now this is a quote okay, um, by Sir Stamford Raffles. Right. Now this is the usual quote that I would say um, you know, uh, uh, the colonial powers would, would say. It's a typical statement, you know, the kind of uh, we are more enlightened than you. Right? Okay? We are the most civilized you know, uh, uh, people and you know, our task is to educate you. But in, in this particular quote, you know, he kind of, um, I suppose, uh, um, says that, well, you know, uh, one of the, the areas that, uh, of education, okay, um, that the British can implement, right, in the colonies is that of the arts. Okay, so he specifically mentioned, I mean, in the last line you can see that, you know, he has mentioned literature and the arts. Okay, but 
The first art instructor from England, Richard Walker, only came in 1923. That's pretty late, <laughs> right? That's pretty late. Um, okay, Richard Walker, who is Richard Walker? Right? Now, Richard Walker, um, you know, he came and he was appointed the art master of the British English schools. Right, which means, and he was later, later promoted to become art superintendent. Okay. Um, and, but I think he was most um, well known for being, you know, for being the, the teacher in Raffles Institution, the art teacher, right? And he was uh, also responsible for organizing art classes in Raffles Institution. Okay, and um, one of his most famous pupils is Lim Cheng Ho, the watercolorist, okay, whose work we are going to see later on. Um, as an artist, uh, Richard Walker, you know, he, you can see that in, in the few works that we have of, of him right, in Singapore, you can see that he actually responds to the local environment. Right? Um, you know, and his works are a sensitive rendering of, uh, of of, of light conditions here, right, in the tropics. Um, you know, in one of his works called Epiphany, it's like a mural-sized work, okay. Um, you know, he kind of depicted um, the Virgin Mary as an Asian woman, right. Okay, so he also adapted to the, I suppose, the local conditions. And in 1949, he became the first, one of the co-founders of the Singapore Art Society. It was a very important society. It was, in fact, the first multicultural society in Singapore. Okay, so this is a, 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 the depiction of uh, Kusu Island. As you know, Kusu Island is a place of pilgrimage, right? Where I think during uh, certain uh, occasions, uh, you know, uh, pilgrims would uh, congregate, you know, on Kusu Island, where there's a temple there. Oh, sure. Thank, thank you. Um, okay, next we have the arrival of the Chinese migrant artists. Right? Now, I mean, the question that we can ponder today is whether there's a distinctive Singaporean style in terms of painting, right? You know, I, I'm not sure. Okay, maybe, maybe after today's uh, you know, uh, talk, right, you can, you can ponder that question more. Um, so, we have the arrival of the Chinese migrant artists who started to arrive in the 1920s. And what happened in China actually also affect or affected what happened here. Okay, because um, some of the artists who arrived here had already been exposed to Western art in China, right, arising from what they call the May 4th Movement, 1919. Now, the May 4th Movement was a kind of political movement that sought to modernize and strengthen China through cultural reform. And um, many artists, uh, in fact, went to Europe to study art. Okay, so when they went back to China, you know, you know um, they actually injected you know, fresh impetus into Chinese art. Okay, so the artists who came to Singapore, right, who eventually settled down here, right, were actually trained in both you know, traditional ink painting as well as Western art. And um, some of these early Chinese artists came here, they participated in exhibitions. Um, you know, and we have some of the famous artists, Chinese artists who actually came here, like Xu Pei Hong, right? Um, and people like that. Okay, but they also came to raise funds for the anti-war efforts in China, because at that time China Right, was fighting the Japanese. Right. Um, so some of the, the Chinese migrant art, uh, artists actually settled in Singapore permanently, and many of them ended up teaching in the Chinese middle schools. Okay, and um, the Society of Chinese Artists was formed in 1935. Now you'll notice that you know, some of these um, early societies, they are ethnic-based. Okay? So you have the Society of Chinese Artists, you also have the Society of Malay Artists, and all that. So, as I mentioned earlier on, the Singapore Art Society was the first multicultural 
right? Art society in Singapore. And of course, you know, uh, you know, this was to this led to the, um, you know, the the founding of uh, the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, okay, which is the oldest institution here in Singapore. Um, and it was uh, founded in 1938 by Lim Hak Okay, Lim Hak Tai was an alumni of the, the so-called the Xiamen, right, the Xiamen Academy of Art in China. Okay, he was also a teacher in the in a teacher trainings college in Jimei, right, in China. Okay, so he had that kind of education background before he, you know, he, he sort of established uh, NAFA. Okay, now the curriculum of NAFA was based on the model of art academies in Shanghai. Okay, because many of the artists who came here, okay, were actually from Shanghai. Okay, they have been exposed to the, you know, the Shanghai um, art system, okay, which itself I, I believe was a combination of both, you know, Chinese and Western traditions. Okay, and among the early ink paint, painting teachers at NAFA were Wu Saiyan and Si Hyang To. Now, Si Hyang To, you know, not much is known about him, but he's, he's a significant painter, right? He, um, he was uh, an accomplished painter and calligrapher, right? He was a painter mostly of uh, birds and flowers, okay? But he was thought to have uh, very masterful brushstrokes, okay? And Wu Saiyan, right? Anyone familiar with Wu Saiyan? Hmm. Right, some of you are, okay? Um, Wu Saiyan was um, the first, I don't know whether it's the only, but the first finger painter right, in Malaya. Okay, and his uh, works uh, at that time were even shown in uh, Europe and America. Um, I believe you know, the, the museum here has uh, quite a number of his works. Right? If you look at his painting, although he painted mm. with a finger, right, you, know, he was, uh, you can see that he was very familiar with the literati the scholars, you know, um, you know, uh, tradition of painting. Okay, like this particular example, okay, called pine tree. Okay, as you know, pine tree is uh, frequently depicted in Chinese art. Okay, it's an evergreen tree. It's um, a symbol of longevity, right? And here you can see how Wu Saiyan, you know, um, attempted to capture the nuances of the pine tree. For example, you know, if you look at the trunk, you know, it, it tries to portray both the tenacity and, or rather contrast the tenacity and strength of the, of the trunk with the delicacy and the softness of the leaves. Right? And he was able to do it quite masterfully in this, uh, in this painting. And this eventually led you know, to the development of the Nanyang style. Right? And again, what is called the Nanyang style, I suppose, has not been sufficiently resolved. Right? Okay, we have only had about one or two kind of, um, um, I suppose, uh, definitions of what the Nanyang style is. Okay? And, um, but what I'll, I'll do today is not to go into that debate, but you know, to, to, to kind of, um, you know, just to, to let you have a knowledge of what this style is about. Now, Nanyang itself um, it literally means Southern Ocean, right? Southern Oceans. Okay, Southern Ocean means uh, this part of the world. Okay, so China is seen as a reference point, right? Okay, the Southeast Asia and all that is seen as, you know, the region that is south of China, okay? Right. And it was actually first used in uh, literary criticism okay, to make reference to the subject matter of Nanyang or Southeast Asia in the works of okay, migrant artists, uh, in, the, in the works of migrant writers in Singapore, Chinese migrant writers. Okay. So it was actually first used in literary criticism. And how did the Nanyang style develop? Okay, I suppose uh, according to uh, couple of art historians here, um, it developed from the historic Bali trip of 1952. Okay, and it was during that trip when a group of four artists, okay, Chong Su Ping, Liu Kang, Chen Chong Sui, and 
Chen Wenxi, right, went to Bali in search of a language and visual expression of their new home. Okay, of course, all these four artists, they were migrant, migrants themselves. Right, they were migrant artists. Okay. Right, and they wanted, I suppose, to, to search for a new expression, a new visual expression. Right? They wanted also to capture the so-called tropical flavor and light of this region. Okay, and to find a uniquely Southeast Asian aesthetic and identity. Okay. So this was to crystallize into what you call the Nanyang style. Right? After they came back from Bali, right, they actually held an exhibition here in Singapore. Okay, and that exhibition was uh, recognized as being a, a very significant exhibition. Okay, so the question is, what is the Nanyang style? Okay, now notice also that many of these artists, right, um, they already came, you know, uh, school or trained in Chinese ink tradition, okay, as well as Western art traditions. Okay, so really the Nanyang style is a synthesis of Chinese pictorial traditions and modern Western style to represent the region's life and culture. Meaning to say that the subject matter itself is regional and is local. Okay, so this, you know, this synthesis and that kind of local region subject matter makes this what you call the Nanyang style. Okay, but as I said, you know, um, <laughs> That is just one kind of limited definition okay, of what the Nanyang style is. Right? But I won't go into that kind of discussion. Um, okay, and you know, the, another question is, you know, does the Nanyang style only extend to um, artists who are associated with NAFA? Right? Okay, so that's, that's another question. I mean, mostly they, they were associated with NAFA. Right? Now, Ling Hak, Ling Hak Tai, you know, the founder of NAFA says, no one can deny the fact that the fine art of Nanyang has its own distinctive traits. It is located at a meeting point of East and West. Okay. So I suppose at that time, artists you know, like Ling Hak Tai, they were searching, I suppose, for a kind of a Nanyang style, a kind of a unique, you know, if you like, a, a Southeast Asian or even Malayan identity in art. Okay, and an art that is uh, at the meeting point of both East and West. Okay, and um, now among the most experimental of all the you know the Nanyang artists, and of course I already mentioned the four. Okay, Chong Su Ping, Chen Wen Si, Chen Yong Sui, Liu Kang, and then you also have George Chen. Okay, and also Lim Hak Tai. Okay, so these six were regarded as the so-called um, well, first generation or pioneer artists. Again, there are problems with those labeling, okay, as I'll okay, um, uh, mention later on. Okay, but these six were regarded as you know, the so-called pioneer artists in Singapore. Right? And, um, and among the six artists, the most experimental and the most innovative is Chong Su Ping. Right? And um, you know, Chong Su Ping, um, you know, he was if you look at his um, body of works, okay, you can see that um, you know, he actually went beyond his own training in the Ink tradition. Okay? He not only combined the two traditions of both East and West, okay, but he experimented with uh, different materials on different supports. Right? He, um, in fact, uh, created uh, metal sculptures made from everyday materials. Right. So he was uh, really very experimental, a very innovative okay, painter. Okay. And here, um, you could see um, this is a work called Indians and Cows. Okay. And at once, I think when you look at it, um, you could see, um, you know, that you could see the, the kind of cubist influence, the cubistic influence in this work, right, in terms of the, uh, the kind of the fragmentation of form in terms of the fact that there's no one fixed single perspective right in this work okay but yet I, I, you know you can see it's uh, very carefully composed okay he has used uh, you know parts of a tree trunk to frame the picture okay and another tree trunk in the middle right to divide the picture frame okay so on the one side you have the two 
you know, um, uh, Indian, um, you know, men there, right, in conversation with each other. And then uh, you have the two cows on the right, okay. But you can see how Su Ping also wanted to uh, create harmony in the painting in terms of the use of color. Okay, so you can see the earthy brown tone okay, being used, being repeated in the tree, the figures, and the cow on the left. Okay, but um, really the whole picture itself is dominated by the white cow right, in the middle of the painting. Okay, and uh, he used, I suppose, uh, rainbow colors as well you know, to depict the, the landscape right, in, the, in the background. This is also a work by Cheong Su Ping, right? Um, well, when you look at this work, you, you think to yourself, that's very Gauguin, right? Very post-impressionist, of course. I mean, you know, they were also exposed to, uh, you know, the, the works of the post-impressionists as well as, I suppose, some of the early uh, modern uh, painters mm. like, like the Fauvis. Um, so this was when, you know, Cheong Su Ping traveled to, I suppose it's in Sarawak, Okay, I suppose he visited long houses and you know, he saw these Iban girls. Um, and you could see that at this time he has already kind of attained his own distinctive style. Okay, because when you look at the figures, you, know, you recognize that it's a Chong Su Ping, right? like these two figures here. Okay? He has sort of um, schematized the figure. Right? And um, again, the, the colors used are very expressive very bold okay and uh, you know and and also another distinctive uh, aspect of this uh, painting are the decorative uh, kind of uh, patterns or effects right that used here to enhance okay the whole painting okay so again you know just to reiterate you know um, Su Ping was really a, you know a, a very innovative painter right in his approach right um, to the art form. And Liu Kang, right? Now anyone, in fact, saw the Liu Kang show when it was here in, I think, two, two years ago, a couple of years back, okay, right? I think most of you are familiar with his work, right? Now, one criticism of Liu Kang, I don't know whether it's a fair criticism or not, right, is the fact that I don't know whether I should be saying this here, right? Whether that the fact that he's a one style artist, right? Now, nothing wrong with being a one style artist, you know, but I suppose that's a, a criticism that has been leveled, right, at him. Okay, but if you look at Liu Kang, you know, he, you know, his, um, although his style remained more or less consistent, uh, um, many of his paintings are a joy to look at, you know, I mean, you know, it's, it's a kind of a feeling you get, you know, when you look at the works of uh, Matisse, for example, okay, which was, is meant to give you that, that kind of, you know, joy, you know, in terms of the fluid lines that he use, right, the harmonious colours in his painting, right. And this is uh, one of his work called Life by the River. And, you know, and it, in this painting, it also shows Liu Kang as a master of composition, right. He really, you know, lay a lot of emphasis on composition in this work, okay? And another, this, you know, kind of um, um, characteristic or trait that you see in his painting is that he's influenced from Chinese ink tradition. Now, it may not be very obvious to you here, right? Um, but, for example, the, the kind of the, the line that outlines his figures and objects, all right? That emphasis on line you know, is, is very Chinese, okay? And also the perspective that you use is not the Western perspective, but the kind of moving perspective of the Chinese, okay? The perspective here is attained not so much by the, the, the kind of fixed linear perspective, but by arrangement of shapes, okay? So much so that it allows your eyes to wander around the painting, okay? So that's a kind of, um, uh, you know, uh, um, a trait from Chinese, right, um, you know, art tradition. Okay, and you can see the kind of emphasis it plays on composition uh, as well. Um, you can see the bridge on the left, right, echoes the meandering river on the right. 
Okay, and he, have, he has uh, carefully placed uh, um, groups of figures throughout the painting, you know, to strike a kind of balance. Okay, you'll notice as well that, you know, in many of Liu Kang's works, um, figures themselves are simplified. Okay, he has uh, reduced the figures, right, uh, you know, to, to the utmost uh, simplicity. Right, and uh, in some of Liu Kang's work, you also see that one distinctive characteristic of his work is the use of white outline. Okay, and the white outline is, uh, can be attributed to the influence from Batik painting, right? So he was also influenced by, you know, the, the uh, local artistic styles here as well. Right? So I'm not sure, you know, whether it's fair to call him a one-style artist, right? <laughs> and of course, not to mention the kind of you know how he strike. He, he you know he attempts to strike a balance and harmony in the painting as well through the use of colors. Okay, this is a work by uh, Chen Wenxi, right? and uh, I think of all the the Nanyang artists, right? Chen Wenxi was the one who was able to successfully or most effectively synthesize both the Western and the Chinese tradition in his work. Right. Um, so here, you know, and, and this, it can be seen most clearly in this painting called Herons. Right. Um, I mean, you know, the, the, this painting itself is a, 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 testi a testament to, you know, Chen's own interest in uh, Chinese painting, right, and calligraphy. Okay, in terms, for example, of the line work, Right, in terms of that uh, little scene on the bottom left okay, of uh, some fishes swimming in the water. Okay. Um, but you could see also the influence from, let's say, the, the modern you know, cubist uh, style. Okay, in terms, again, of the, um, the fragmentation of the picture plane. Okay, the fact that both foreground and background okay, uh, are blurred. Right? Okay, so much so that you know, um, it's difficult to, to make the make out the herons, you know, from the I suppose the tall kind of grasses, right? Okay, on, on, on the on the river stream. Okay, so you could see that you know some of these um, um, the Nanyang artists, you know, they were innovative in that sense. I mean, they combined both right the Western and right the Eastern tradition. And another of artist, of course, is George Chen. Now, you know, if the work that I showed you earlier by Chong Su Ping reminds you of, well, a work by Paul Gauguin, right? This one reminds you of a work by Paul Cezanne. <laughs> okay. um, and George Chen was, you know, she has been called a cosmopolitan lady, okay, because, you know, she was born in Paris, unlike the others. And, you know, she, she moved, um, she lived, I think, in both Paris and New York, right? And in New York, she attended the Art Students League, okay? Quite a famous art school, right? And she has uh, exhibited in Paris before she even came, right, to Singapore. Um, so if, you, if one looks at a work, especially a still life like this one, you know, I mean, it's an inevitable that we will make comparison with the great Cezanne. Right, in terms of uh, you know, the, the interest in the, the formal qualities of the work, the brush strokes, the texture, the volume. Right? So here you can see that she uses very dynamic brush strokes as well as uh, very dark, heavy tones okay, to suggest the texture and the volume okay, of the, uh, the fruits right? as well as the other objects on the on the, in this still life. Okay? And the kind of the very focused and compact composition of the work makes the fruits in fact more tangible all right okay and um, you also kind of um, I suppose the colors and and the brush strokes also emphasize okay the the kind of the, the flattened the, pic, the the surface quality and the two-dimensional quality of the work itself and Georgia Chan later went on to become a long-time uh, instructor in NAFA where she was a mentor to many artists. I don't know, I always, when I look at this painting, I say, well, 
I can see that I'm, I'm not a sexist or something, right? But you can see that it's done by a woman's hand, right? The kind of, uh, you know, it's not as robust and solid as a Cezanne's work, you know, right? There's a bit more sensitivity, I suppose, right? In the handling of colors and, and brush. Okay. How am I doing for time? Sorry. I'm going a bit slower than usual today. <laughs> okay. Not too bad, eh? about, an, about an hour. Okay, and then we move on to the Equator Art Society. Um, now, the Equator Art Society, um, I mean, their works were, in a sense, very different from those that you have seen, you know, the Nanyang style works. Okay, um, because they are concerned with the connection between art and life between art and reality. Okay. Um, the Equator Society was, uh, you can call it an art group, a grouping, a collective of artists okay, formed in 1956 that promoted social realist art okay, and that was nationalist and anti-colonialist in its stance. Um, no, because at that time, um, you know, the, the British were ruling Singapore Okay, and the 1950s was a particularly tumultuous time, right, in Singapore history. Okay, there were riots, you know, there were strikes, right. Okay, so you, you see that, you know, there were nationalist forces at work, okay. Although, to the British, you know, these forces were deemed to be communists, right. I don't know, again, whether that's an accurate label, right. Um, and some of these artists were in sympathy or they were sympathetic right to what was happening there okay and they were trying also to capture that in their work okay. so they adopted the language of social realism okay so in their works they depicted okay the struggles and the labors of the masses ordinary people right and they were very opposed to the western style of art okay there's that they said it has nothing to do with nationalistic aims and identity Okay. So I suppose in their work, they strove for an art that I suppose promotes nationalist ideals and nationalist identity. Right. And uh, woodcut was a favorite medium. Okay, why is that the case? Why do you think? And, and you know, when we talk about woodcut in Singapore, right, that, you know, 1950s and 1960s was a peak of the woodcut movement in Singapore. Right. Because wood, wood cut, as you know, you know was a, a material that um, allows you to produce hundreds of, right, of, of prints, okay? And, you know, you could easily propagate your ideas, right, you know, uh, through, right, through the medium of wood cut, okay? And so wood cut was a favorite medium of this, uh, the, the social, um, the Equator Society artists. Now, unfortunately, I only have time to just highlight, you know, one, um, of the artists. Um, okay, um, now this is actually a very interesting quote. Okay, it's from the, the catalog, exhibition catalog of the Chinese High School Arts Association. As I mentioned earlier, okay, many of the migrant artists who came to Singapore ended up teaching in the Chinese middle schools, like Chinese High School, Chuncheng uh, High School. Um, and uh, it's true that later on these schools became a hotbed for you know what the British would term communist or left-wing activities right okay and you can see the kind of fiery you know confrontational um, uh, stance taken even for an exhibition catalog right okay and um, Okay, so, so you could see what the objectives of, uh, and, and some, many of these artists of the equator, right, they were also associated right, with the, uh, the Chinese middle schools. Okay. For example, as, uh, as, as teachers, right? Have you all seen this work? Right. It's not officially a national treasure, but it is unofficially Okay, one of our, considered to be one of our, um, you know, uh, masterpieces, right, of uh, Singaporean painting. Of course, if you've been to that show, A Change for you have seen this, 
And this was played side by side, if you recall, with another of uh, Chuamiati's famous work, the epic poem of Malaya. Right? Right, this Chinese uh, orator, you know, who's uh, you know, arousing the patriotic spirits of the students that are seated around him. Okay. But I'm just going to show you this work um, called the National Language Class. Now, Chuamati was one of the uh, members of the equator. Right? Um, and in this work, um, National Language Class, uh, on the surface, you know, it might seem like just an ordinary national language class. Right? And in any of such uh, language class, you will learn some basic phrases. Right? What is your name? Okay. Where do you live? Right. Now, um, of course, there, there, you know, when some people look at this work, um, you know, they tend to read further into this work. Okay? To, they tend to analyze what you call um, the surface that's underneath this work, okay? And they believe that, well, you know, there's uh, something more to this work that meets the eye, right? Um, okay, so what you have here is a Malay teacher, the Chekgu, okay, teaching Malay, the Malay language to his students. If you notice the students, what do you notice about the students? They comprise of different ethnic groups. You see an Indian there, a Chinese. Right? And you can see that they also come from all walks of life and profession. Students, okay, the lady in the Chongsam. Right? Okay, and, um, now, and then to, you, know, you connect that with the phrases okay, that you see on the blackboard. Okay? So you look at all these different um, aspects of the painting and you try to construct a kind of, uh, I suppose, an inter interpretation of some sort, right? That really, this work could be, I suppose, um, um, a work that promotes nationalist ideals and identity, right? Okay, because it was also, I'm not sure whether the date is right, 1950, hmm. 1959, sorry, yes, that's right, thanks. 1959. Okay, and it was a time, you know, when, uh, I don't know whether Malay was adopted as a, the national language then, okay? But, you know, people at that time, you know, the local people, they were looking for a kind of a Malayan identity. Okay, they were clamoring for Malay to be the national language. So there was a lot of nationalistic fervor taking place. And this work has been interpreted as such, as promoting, you know, nationalist ideals and identity. Okay, one could read, in fact, further into this, look, looking at the round table. Okay, normally in classes, you don't have round tables. They are normally rectangular. Okay, round tables are only found in the kopitiams, the coffee shops, okay, where people will gather to discuss things like politics. Right? Okay, so, in fact, there are many other things to be said about this painting, but that roughly, you know, kind of um, uh, gives you the kind of basic overview of this painting. And then we have the ten men, and I wrote that in bracket, woman group, okay, because it's not fair just to call it a ten man group, because there were some women, uh, you know, um, artists who were, you know, part of the ten man group. Now, Ten Man Group uh, is a very loose grouping of artists. Okay, and their aim was uh, simply to come together you know, and participate in field trips around the region. Okay, so they, they, they have uh, made uh, uh, art excursions to uh, places like Malaysia, or at that time Malaya. You know, they have visited Cambodia. Right? I believe even uh, Sarawak. You know, I think, I think Nepal as well. So, you know, they, they travel regionally, right? And I, th I suppose that most times, right, um, they travel in a group of 10. Although I think the last one, you know, there were about 16 artists, okay, who travel in a group. Okay, um, and um, among the leader, the leader of this group 
the unofficial leader was um, Ye Tuwei, right? Right, Ye Tuwei. And this is the second Tenmen trip to Java and Bali. Okay, you can see some of the women artists there. Now, who is Ye Chuwei? Right? Um, now, Ye Chuwei was, uh, as I mentioned, the kind of unofficial leader of this group, the Ten Man group. Okay, but he's also an artist who has faded into obscurity. Okay, so much so that you know, um, not many people know of him, even though you know, he was always an active member of the Ten Man group. Um, but you know, when the Singapore Museum uh, organized a kind of a, a retrospective of uh, Ye Chu Wei in 2010, okay, be, people began to take notice. Okay, people began to take notice, for example, of uh, Ye Chu Wei's uh, innovative approach to painting. Okay, because really, if you look at his style, you know, I mean. I can't find a, a, another artist of a similar style, right? Um, I mean, if you look at the painting itself, right? For example, this work called um, Untitled, okay, and then bracket, Dayak Man Love Cockfighting. Okay, so the subject matter here is, uh, is uh, cockfighting, okay, among the Dayaks of, uh, you know, Borneo and Sarawak, right? Okay, but if you look at the kind of the um, the aesthetic quality of the work itself, okay, it looks kind of primitive, I suppose, right? Yes, that kind of primitive quality. Okay, because Ye Chu Wei himself was influenced by the historical traditions of Asia, right, as well as you know the West, right. And uh, here you can see, for example, I mean, when you look at this work, it reminds you of uh, a cave drawing, right. It reminds you of an ancient Chinese rubbing or stone carving. Right? And uh, in fact, if you look at the script itself, the Chinese script, okay, that's actually an, a script from the oracle bone. You know, oracle bones were, you know, those uh, uh, bones used for divination during the Shang dynasty. Right? Okay? And, you know, it was, I suppose, you know, he was very innovative in terms of his style and also very daring because you know, if you look at this, the color they use, he actually used the color black for his figures. You know, and you know, not many artists at that time would use, you know, the color black, right? Okay, for 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 painting. Okay, so truly, you know, this uh, was an artist that we are we have been delighted to rediscover. Okay, and uh, because he's such a, I suppose, a, a unique uh, painter. Oh, I have a quote by Ye Chuwei, right? Uh, yeah, he was influenced, as I said, you know, by Chinese woodblock printing, stone engraving, oracle bone, bronze inscription, right? Oh. And also, you know, he says that if you look at his, um, you know, his method of uh, painting, right? He actually used the palette knife. Right now, the, the the reason why he used the palette knife was that you know he wanted to make you know give his uh, uh, painting the appearance of you know of uh, of stone carving, you know of something being carved out of stone, right? Okay, and that's another reason as well. Okay, um, we are coming towards uh, uh, the end of it. Not, not much to go. Um, the modern art society and the rise of abstract art. Okay, now the modern art society was formed in 1964, right? And its leader and voice was Ho Ho Ying. Okay, and it was, um, I suppose, the modern art society was established as a reaction to um, the art scene in Singapore at that time, which was dominated by the social realist style that I just mentioned earlier. Okay. Right, and uh, modern society wanted to do away with representational art altogether. I suppose like what the modern artists in early, 19th, uh, early 20th century um, Europe okay, was trying to do. 
Okay, and they felt that realist works of the equator lacked creativity and were just interested in making social and political statements. Ho Ho Ying. I was just being told, uh, reminded in fact, right, that uh, there's a solo exhibition of Ho Ho Ying in Nafa at the moment. It's on until Sunday. Okay, so I, I suppose that, that is worth seeing, I suppose, although I've not seen it myself. Right. Um, now, Ho Ho Ying was a recent recipient of the Cultural Medallion, okay, Singapore's uh, highest cultural award. Right. And um, so, this is uh, one of his work. Okay, you can see if you know in this particular work uh, there is no kind of discernible subject matter. All right. Although you see some uh, ghostly white spectral forms, you know, kind of uh, dancing on an indeterminate space, okay, you, you, you can't quite make out what they are. Right? So this, the painting in, in that sense is, uh, is, is abstract. Right? But we have a quote by Lim Chong Kiat, you know, of, uh, you know, who says that he has arrived at a very distinctive and assured control of textures and abstract forms. Right? And again, I, you know, I'm not sure whether Ho Ho Ying had that uh, you know, um, training in, in Chinese calligraphy. Okay, but we can see, you know, kind of um, compare his works, you know, to some of the, right, the lines, okay, um, that one sees, right, in calligraphy as well. Okay. Now, Lim, Lim Chong Kian himself was a, a very important figure. He was the founder of what he called the Alpha Gallery. Okay, now the Alpha Gallery was one of those, uh, you know, one of the earliest uh, art galleries in Singapore that uh, you know attempted to promote Singaporean art, okay, and I think one distinctive feature of that gallery was you know um, artists had a free hand in organi organizing their own shows, okay, All right? The Alpha Gallery that operated in the early seventies. Okay, the second generation artists. I think that the, sec the use of the word second generation, okay, as uh, you know, uh, some people would, would, would use, is a misleading label. Okay? As with, I suppose, the first generation or the pioneer artists. Right? Now, the, the six Nanyang style artists that I mentioned okay, earlier, right, they, they, are, they are known now as the pioneer, the first generation artists. Okay, and that label itself originated in the 1980s when the National Museum, okay, at that time the National Museum Art Gallery held a series of shows of these artists, the Nanyang right, artists. Okay, so the label kind of stuck. Right? And then later on, uh, another label was coined, which is the second generation artists. Right? And, um, and the second generation artist was actually used to refer to artists who were students of the first generation Nanyang style artists, which is a fact, right? Many of them were, you know, students of the first generation artists. And another fact is that they went to Euro America for their art education. Okay, but uh, you know, can we limit the term second generation to just this group of artists? Okay, or how is there another way of defining, right? Okay, this group of artists. Okay, but how about other groups of artists, you know, who were practicing at that time? Okay, so, and who did not go to, um, you know, uh, Europe or America to study? Okay, so there are all these questions, right? Um, and they practice a modernist and largely abstract style. Okay, so um, among the core group of these uh, artists, okay, are people like, um, artists like Teo Eng Seng, Thomas Yeo, Go Beng Kwan, Anthony Poon, right? Okay, and uh, this is a work by uh, Tio Eng Seng, right? Um, they also adopted a modernist abstract idiom. Although I, I must say that you know um, artists like Tio Eng Seng as well as Go Beng Kwan, right? They tried to introduce um, you know local elements into their work, right? So that's what made their work, you know different, right, from those in the West, which in the first place influence, right, the artistic development, 
right? He was in the West that they were exposed, you know, to all the abstract, you know, paintings and styles. Right? Now, Tio Ying was a very innovative artist. Now, if you look at the caption, look at the medium itself. It says, paper dye sculpt. Now, what is that? What is paper dye sculpt? Right? Now, after he came back from uh, the UK, you know, he um, later on became uh, the art, the head of the um, head of art in United World College. Right? And, um, and you know, paper has always been the, the source of art in both China and Japan. Okay? But um, paper has always been a kind of uh, the basis of, you know, merely serve as support. Okay, but here, he has turned paper into the main ingredient itself. Right? So he actually processed paper into a kind of pulp, and then he added color, shape, and texture to it. Okay? So in doing that, you know, Tio Eng Seng has blurred the boundaries between painting and sculpture, right? resulting in his uh, paper dye sculpt works. Right? Now this particular work is uh, from his Otoso series. Now, Otosos uh, is an abbreviation for on the other side of silence. Okay, it was a very difficult moment in his life okay, where he actually suffered in silence. Okay, and what you see here is um, where he used paper dye sculpt. And if you look at the deep depression or imprint, okay, that's actually the imprint of you know, the wooden clock right, that Chinese people used to wear. Okay. And you see a lot of uh, other kind of uh, Chinese customary um, symbols. Okay, there's a horseman there and uh, the dog god. Okay, now all those, you know, he wanted to, as I said, you know, um, introduce right, elements relating to Chinese customs and culture right, to his work. Uh, I mean, of course, they also enhance the colors right, okay, of the work itself okay, and the vividness of the work. Thomas Yeo, okay, Thomas Yeo essentially was, he was essentially a landscape painter. He painted not actual landscape, but imaginary landscapes. Okay, and later on, uh, he went on to do uh, collages. Okay, and his collages were also based on landscape themes. Okay, and he traveled widely, you know, and as he traveled, he, you know, tried to capture the impressions of these uh, places in, in sketches and photography. Right, this is uh, one of his work called Red Earth. Right. It's, uh, you know, if you look at this work, it has uh, photographic quality, right? but at the same time, you know, it's, um, it has a very bold uh, you know, composition. Okay? Very bold, but yet very simple composition. Okay, here you can see how the artist uh, um, divides the painting you know, into different domains, you know, the, the sky above and then the earth you know, uh, below. Right? Okay, so this is a, a work by Thomas Yeo, okay, and he's uh, widely recognized to be one of the finest, I suppose, uh, Western landscape, um, or rather landscape artist in a Western style, right, in, in Singapore. And then we have Anthony Poon. Okay, ever heard of Anthony Poon? The, uh, the Singapore Museum also held a uh, retrospective of Anthony Poon after his death. I can't remember the actual date. It was uh, about a couple of years ago, right? Um, now, I think of all the the other artists. I mean, Anthony Poon was really the um, and is you know quintessentially formalist painter. Okay, he was simply interested in the you know formal relationships between the you know between line, color, texture, um, movement. In his work, okay, that, that is to say, he was only interested in you know exploring the relationships between the formal qualities in the work. Um, this is part of his uh, so-called wave series, right? Um, and uh, he was influenced by a number of movements in the West. For example, hard edge painting, right? Okay, hard edge painting is uh, paintings that, you know where you see the abrupt transitions of color. Right? He was also influenced by op art, optical art. Okay? 
So you see in his work, he also used lines and colors to give a kind of uh, optical illusion in his work. Right? And he was also, also influenced by color field painting. Okay, so in his work, you can also see flat, you know, planes or fields of, of solid colors. Okay, where brush strokes and textures are not distinct at all, okay, are, are not visible. Right? Now, in his approach to painting, you know, Anthony Poon was very rigorous, you can, one can imagine. In fact, he actually took a very mathematical approach right, to painting, even using graph papers and all that. Right? So he had a very, uh, very mathematical and calculated approach right, to painting. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I think we can last for another 10 minutes, huh? so no worries. Now, the title itself um, influences the way you look at the work. Because the title itself, you know, he was very concerned with, the, as I said, the technical, the formal aspect of the work. CR stands for, can you see the rate there? The cadmium rate. Okay, CR stands for the cadmium rate. Right? Okay, you see in the work here. Right? So the cadmium rate here is, uh, is contained within the linear elements, and then you see the, his characteristic waves, right? Okay, um, as well, right, in the painting. Okay, and uh, just a couple of, uh, you know, watercolorists, right? I mean, I mean, you know, just a few weeks ago, you know, in the, in the Straits Times, uh, there was a feature article, okay, which uh, reported on the revival of, uh, you know, watercolor painting in Singapore, right? And that, you know, more uh, watercolorists here are, in fact, holding exhibitions, okay? I suppose intrinsically, you know, watercolor, you know, is not as valuable as oil. You know, that's why you know, in, in the auction, you know, it never can fetch as high a price. There's always a limit to how much you can pay, right, for watercolor. Um, but maybe Ong Kim Seng would disagree with me, right? Um, of course, he's recognized today as the greatest living watercolorist, um, and he says, and I believe Ode to Art has a couple of his works displayed. Right? Just, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> we have already have a sales speech there. Okay, never mind. I'm not making a sales speech. Yeah? Okay. But, you know, we have the work and later on you can actually have a look at his works. Um, yeah, he has a lot of uh, high regard for the medium. Okay, and actually it's one of the most difficult medium to, to, to master. It's quite true. Okay, because of its unpredictability, the fact that it's harder to blend the colors, right, because it's, it's a water-based medium and all that. Okay, and but it's best used, it was best used to be able to capture atmospheric effects like shifting light and changing weather. Right? And I think Ong Kim Seng has sort of uh, you know was able to you know master that you know in his in his own work. Okay, but uh, before that we have Lim Cheng Ho. Okay, Lim Cheng Ho was the founder of the Singapore Watercolor Society in the 1960s. And um, He's acknowledged to be um, one of the greatest, if not the greatest, right, watercolorist in Singapore, right, in Singaporean painting. Um, and he was uh, a student, as I mentioned, of Richard Walker, because at that time in schools, you know, the, the media, the, the kind of medium that you use, you learn in painting, is, was actually watercolor. Now, this is, a. Uh, if you look at it, it doesn't, seem like the Singapore River, right? You know, all the rubbish and the debris, you know. It is a rather romanticized view of the Singapore River, right? Um, and it was said that Lim Cheng Ho, now Lim Cheng Ho, like Ong Kim Seng, was a self-taught artist. Although, of course, he was, uh, he was taught by Richard Walker, you know, in Raffles Institution, but he was essentially a self-taught artist, okay, who built his art through practice and experimentation. Now, in this work, you'll notice um, he was also, you know, he, he, he gave a lot of attention to the composition in, of his, in his work. And he could, he could just spend days outside, you know, just to get the composition right. Okay, and we can see in this work itself. And this work, you can see that, you know, can you see the row of boats there, right? That's the kind of devising, di dividing horizontal line, okay? And then in the background, using very light, warm, um, vague uh, grace, okay, you know, he actually depicts the building, 
right, which tends to fade into the distance. Okay, and stronger colors were used, you know, in uh, for the boats and all that, you know, to to kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, strongly articulate, okay, the kind of the the depth of the painting. Okay, and the boat in the foreground, in fact, helps to disrupt, okay, or rather disrupts the symmetry and the balance in the painting. Right. Okay, but other than that, you know, it's an excellent painting. It, it, it has a very uh, watery feel to it. Okay, and that's because you actually use um, the wet on wet method, right? In this painting, the ala prima, right? Method for this painting. Okay. And Ong Kim Seng, right? Now, if you are familiar with Ong Kim Seng's work, um, you know, you'll notice that he tends to have a preference for painting architectural structures. Okay. Now, Ong Kim Seng, you know, he was the first Asian to be admitted to the American Watercolor Society. Okay, that's a great honor, I would say. Right. But why this preference for architectural structures, for buildings? Okay. Now, the, the first thing is that you know, he travels widely. Okay. And wherever he travels, he, he would paint. Okay. And he says that architecture you know, gives you, you know, the, 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 the sense and the feel of the place itself. Okay, so that's one reason why he painted, you know, why this preference for buildings and architecture. And secondly, he said that, you know, when he paints architecture, he's like um, trying to take over from where the architects have left off, right? So in, in a sense, he's also trying to construct, not with brick and mortar, but he's trying to construct with pigment, okay? This, uh, right, this architectural um, kind of, these artifices and buildings. Okay, so um, another distinctive, of course, feature of Ong Kim Seng's work also is the, the, the quality of light as well, okay, that you'll find in his painting. Okay, so there are a couple of uh, paintings here. In 2008, he did a distinctive body of work based on, um, you know, um, HDB estates in Singapore. Okay, right, and... Um, oh, sorry, uh, the one on the bottom left, is the I believe that's I um, hmm, can't remember that's not Singapore of course can you, can you remember uh, recognize that where's that place please Nepal correct Nepal Kathmandu right Kathmandu hmm uh, okay I have to go a bit quicker now sorry I you know I feel I have to highlight this artist Wishu Leong. Okay, because you know in Singapore we what what I mean one of the I don't I don't call it a problem but one of the tendencies we have here, right? Um, when we write about art history is that we or we write about art is that we tend to focus on the same few artists, okay? So these same few artists eventually they become part of the canon and all that, right? Okay, but there were many other outstanding artists you know who I feel have been marginalized, have been under acknowledged. Okay, have not been given enough recognition. Okay, and one of these is Wei Shu Leong. Right? Now Wei Shu Leong, you know, has a distinction of being probably the only artist who kind of specialized in still life. Right? I mean there were a couple of other artists who you know produce a body of works um, you know involving still life, but uh, they are not as I suppose um, well known as, as him, Wei Shu Leong. Okay, who already have a lot of success in the auction market, but okay, not enough success, I would say, right, in terms of you know, having a place in our art history. Um, and he has a very distinctive way of painting still life. You can see that. Right? He specialized in painting bird cages. Right? And I was just told that the bird cage for him was a metaphor. A metaphor for the selfishness of man in trying to exploit birds, right, for their own purposes. Okay, but anyway, that's the kind of the metaphor. Now we look at the formal quality of his work, you know. I mean, normally the bird cage would be painted and alongside a few of uh, antique, either fruits or antique objects, right, that you see in this painting. Now when I look at this painting, you know, if you look at it overall, it has that kind of um, Literati Chinese painting feel to it, you know, the overall Chinese sensibility. Although Wei Shulong never did have a formal 
training in Chinese ink, right? Um, you know, you feel that, you know, because in, in Chinese painting, you know, the, the painting itself becomes an object for contemplative veneration, okay, for meditation. And I, I think that's how, you know, you feel when you look at, you know, Wishu Long still life, okay? And I think that has a lot to do with the space itself because he was um, also influenced by this Chinese theorist called Xie He. He's a sixth century theorist who wrote the six principles of Chinese painting. Okay, and uh, you know, two of the principles is obvious in Wu Shu Liang's work, right? For example, uh, one is called correspondence to the object, right? Uh, meaning to say, it has to do with the depiction of the form, okay, the shape and the line, okay? And the line becomes very obvious in the bird cage itself. Um, and then another of, um, you know, the, the, the theory that he probably has applied to, to this work is one of what you call division and planning. Okay, division of planning has to do with uh, the structure, the arrangement, the placement of the work. Okay, uh, having to do with things like space and depth in the work. Right, so you can see that, you know, he has uh, given emphasis to those aspects in his work. Right, and also the kind of balance and stillness, right, that you see in his still life. Right, it is uh, also quite obvious. And also the notion of the void, okay, the positive and the negative, right? Of course, you have uh, second generation artists, you know, still actively painting today, right? But I think, you know, their emergence meant that, you know, the spotlight, okay, um, you know, has really been on artists who have uh, dealt with, uh, you know, contemporary art forms rather than, you know, painting itself. Right? Um, okay, and then this uh, issue was brought up, okay, this issue was brought up, um, you know, uh, in 2012, right in the Straits Times, or the Straits Times, I don't know whether many, of, some of you recall, has this um, uh, heading, painting under fire, right? And that, uh, that uh, article was also in response to what was happening in the art scene at that time, okay? Because uh, shortly before, um, you know, uh, we have the, um, you know, a 70-year-old student won the most prestigious art prize in Singapore, the UOB Painting of the Year. And that makes about three out of eight years that the winner actually went to, you know, um, artists who were under 18 years of age, right? Okay, and you know, that sparked uh, people in the art, art community, you know, who were asking, um, I mean, of course, you know, they, you know um, some of the more experienced and established artists were, um, you know, had a lot of criticism about the painting, calling it, for example, immature and all that. Okay, but I won't go into that today, right? Okay, I'm just giving you the context of that, uh, you know, article that appeared in the Straits Times. Okay, because, you know, by having a, a very young uh, boy who was experimenting with oil for the first time ever, and winning, you know, such a prestigious competition means what? It means that there are no other painters in Singapore, good enough painters, okay, who could, you know, right, um, um, so-called challenge or beat a 17-year-old boy. Okay, so that, uh, okay, got, um, you know, sparked off this whole debate. Is painting dead in Singapore? Right, is painting dead in Singapore? Any, any views here whether you think painting is dead in Singapore? Anyone? You all, you all agree that painting, by your silence, I think you agree that painting is dead. Okay. I mean, if you just look at the recently concluded Singapore Biennale, right? I mean, the Biennale itself is, uh, the idea of the Biennale, you know, is antagonistic, I would say, to the idea of painting. Although you, you see a few works there, but normally in international Biennales, you know, you don't see that many paintings being exhibited, okay? Because uh, unless, you know, those paintings are considered to be cutting edge themselves, right? Okay, so yes, you're right. I mean, you know, the, the general feeling, I mean, not only general feeling, I mean, you know, it's true that, you know, 
I mean, just by looking at exhibitions around you today, okay, I mean, we can just count how many exhibitions there are dedicated to painting. All right. But I won't say that painting is dead, right? Maybe dead is not the word to use, right? It has declined somewhat, okay, but it has not disappeared, okay, it has not died. Certainly not, okay? I would say far from it. Okay, in fact, um, artists, oh, by the way, this is the painting by Esmond Lowe, the 70 year old boy. He was trying to, I mean, this painting is a self portrait, okay, but through that, he's trying to um, um, uh, comment on the, the stressful education that we have in Singapore, right? Okay, where he himself as a student experienced a kind of uh, loss of direct direction and a kind of burnout, right? Okay, as I said, there are still many good artists around, good painters rather, around. Okay, and some of these painters have tried to reinvent the language of painting. Okay, I, I shall quickly go through the six paintings and then, right, we'll end. David Chan, okay, who, um, you know, um, in his early paintings, right, he's already been in the art scene for 10 years. And uh, in his early paintings, he um, paints um, a lot of animals. Okay, because he used animals as a critique for the kind of ge genetic um, engineering okay, that, that we are doing today, where we kind of uh, exploit animals okay, for our own benefit. Right? Okay, for example, the pig. Right, um, you know the pig. Uh, they were, they have been carrying out experiments to to grow organs in a pig that could match human organs. Okay, I don't know whether they have been successful. Okay, so as to prevent a kind of rejection, you know, of of um, you know, uh, animal organs when transplanted onto human beings. But David Chan said there's a kind of uh, irony here. There's an irony, irony because you know the the you know. The pig has been considered to be, or at least parts of it has been considered to be delicacy in Chinese cuisine. Right? Okay, but yet here it's being used for medical research to help those right, who have eaten the pig before. Right? So there's a kind of irony here. I mean his works always have a kind of a sense of humor, but there's a, a serious underlying message below. Right? So here you can see you can see a fork, but instead of a knife, it's actually a scalpel. A scalpel, and you can see the pig there playing with um, tomato, right? And uh, you know it's oblivious. The pig is simply oblivious. It's just playing. It's, it's oblivious to its fate. Okay. Either way, it loses out. Okay. Either as food, or you know, it's for medical research, right? So his uh, his painting is always very fun to look at, right? He's still very much active today, right, David Chan. Uh, he has also gone into uh, making sculptures as well today. My colleague. In La Salle, Yen Wu. Okay, he is um, really a pure painter. Okay, when I call him a pure painter, means uh, he he's simply interested in exploring, you know, the relationship between uh, the formal qualities of the painting, right? Um, the lines, the brush strokes, texture, color, etc. Okay, and um, Yen Wu's painting might seem very chaotic and messy. Okay, but there's an underlying coherence and structure in this painting. Okay, I think this uh, title is very apt, the curtain. Okay, I'm not sure whether the the black veil on the right refers to the curtain. Okay, but if you look at this painting itself, you can see like it's like a stage. Okay, and all the different uh, you know lines and and colors, smudges and all that you see in the painting are actors on the stage. Right. Okay, and I suppose the, the kind of the, the yellow, you know, soon like, you know, uh, uh, gesture on the left and the black veil on the, on the right, they can be considered to be the main actors, right, in this stage itself. Okay, so Ian Wu, you know, I mean, he's a really, you know, an established artist today, you know, still very much um, dedicated, okay, to, you know, to, to the painting craft, right. Another of my colleague, and well, he was also my student, right? But now colleague, okay, um, teaches uh, fine art in, in La Salle, um, Jeremy Sharma, okay, also, okay, uh, fast becoming a, a very um, established artist in Singapore, right? His works were shown at the Singapore Biennale. Um, this work called Kurosawa, okay, um, 
Now, again, you know, Jeremy Sharma, like Ian Wu, is very much concerned with the processes and techniques of painting. Right? And there's a lot of thought process that actually goes into their works. Right? They were very much concerned with how materials, different materials react with different surfaces. Okay, so for this, he actually used aluminium panels. Okay? He actually used a metal based paint mm. enamel. Right? And he also uses a lot of varnish for this work. But his method of painting is also quite innovative. Well, at least I suppose in the local context, right? He actually used the pouring method. The dripping method. Okay, so paint was actually poured at specific angles, right? And uh, in this work, you can see that he plays with contrast, contrast of light and dark, positive, negative, right? White and black. Why the title Kurosawa? Akira Kurosawa is you know a Japanese filmmaker, and his films are you know uh, known for their colors and hues. And in his film, you know black and white, you know are actually used to refer to uh, evil and good. Right? So hence, you know, the title of this work, Kurosawa. Okay, uh, another three more to go. I'm sure you are acquainted, at least some of you, with Jane Lee. You know? um, Jane Lee also, you know, that's how long I've been teaching in, <laughs> in La Salle. Okay, she was also a, a student of mine. And, uh, you know, when she was a student of mine, you know, I sort of, uh, in my own class, I've um, introduced her to some of the more, um, the minimalist painter, okay? Uh, people like Robert Ryman and some of the minimalist, minimalist painter and I recall and she reminded me that you know she was uh, very much interested right in those painters because in their work they place a lot of emphasis on techniques and processes right they try to push the boundaries of the medium and that's what she's trying to do okay in her work in her own work she's not only trying to extend the boundary of pain itself but even the support right of of uh, of painting Okay, often her work goes beyond the rectangular format of painting. Okay? And you know, sometimes her work can even extend downwards onto the floor, like a, like a piece of fabric. Right? Okay, now this particular work was uh, shown in uh, 2008 Singapore Biennale. I don't know whether uh, some of you remember. As you go up the stairs, okay, the whole wall is filled all right, with, uh, with, with this work called raw canvas. Okay, now if you look at the right, Okay, um, you know, so here, you know, in even her own work, she, she blurs the boundaries between okay, what is two-dimensional and what is three-dimensional, right? She emphasizes a lot on the physicality of painting, painting as a physical object, right? And her method of painting is also quite innovative, okay? She's like, these layers of paint are like woven together, okay? And in fact, she has a fashion background as well, right? And instead of a brush, she would use things like syringes, you know? She use syringe to, you know, apply the squiggles of paint, right, in her work. And as she says, you know, it's like a cloth that speaks or keeps its secret, right? Okay, two more. And uh, Ng Jun Kiet. Uh, I'm not showing them all because they're my students, but they so happen to be my students at La Salle. Okay, very innovative painter, Ng Jun Kiet. Also shown, um, this work was shown in the Singapore Biennale, right, lit cities right and for this work uh, he actually used uh, you know Junkia's work always have to do with the landscape either the landscape or you know some uh, topographical kind of um, uh, forms right and in this work um, lead cities he actually used images of uh, major cities he would superimpose these images and then he would cover these superimposed images with thick impasto like paint okay that gives the illusion of moving, right, or movement as well, All right. So, and and the work itself is illuminated, right. That's why, hence, the the title "Lit Cities," okay. So much so that you know the thick, voluminous paint becomes uh, visible. Um, okay, so here Junket also tries to you know blur the boundary, I suppose, between um, you know the two-dimensional quality of painting and three-dimensional sculptural form, All right. So. Again, you know, artists at Junket are really dedicated to, you know, the painting craft itself. And lastly, you all heard of Ron Pang? Oh, I can see a lot of heads nodding. That means it's really, you know, uh, becoming quite uh, well known, right? He is, 
All right, you know, I mean, uh, just, just uh, I mean, Roman Pang was a recent graduate, well, about two years, right, of La Salle. Um, you know, his works are today very um, sought after, I would say, maybe sought after by collectors. I mean, when, it, when you know, a gallery, you know, showed his work in the recent art stage, you know, it was sold out on the day of the vernissage, if I'm not mistaken. Is it on the day of the vernissage or something, right? Okay, all his works were sold out. Okay. And that's because I think painters like Ruben Pang, okay, they, uh, he, you know, has, you know, he was, he's willing to, to extend, right, um, the boundaries, to push the boundaries of painting. Okay. I mean, to be fair to, you know, some of the older artists, you know, I suppose you need to innovate as well. Innovation is quite important, you know. You need to reinvent painting. You can't paint, for example, Singapore River all the time, right, I suppose, okay? You know, I suppose when you talk about contemporary art, you know, you need to make painting relevant, right, to contemporary art, okay? And I think Ruan Pang is someone who is able to push the boundary, okay, in the way that he works. Right. I, I'm not talking so much about subject matter. I mean, this is a portrait series, you can see, like, yes, you know, it has a very ghostly sort of spectral figure. But in his processes of working, right, um, you know, he works, for example, what he would do is he would, he would blend his colours and then he would shape the colours by using things like his fingers, sandpaper, right, and palette knife, okay? And he would continue and continue, as he says there, right, um, you know, once the initial layer is dry, I apply new strokes and layers right, of what I think will create an interesting reaction. Right? And then cover and remove what I think has become unnecessary. So it's a whole, you know, it's a process of, you know, um, of, of painting. He goes through a whole process. Okay? And I think that that's what makes his, uh, his work you know, so fresh and, and so innovative. Right? Okay, I think, uh, well, I've, I've said enough for this evening. I hope, uh, you know, I've given you a, a, a good idea of, uh, you know, the, not only the history of painting in Singapore, but, you know, the, the, some of the kind of the trends that are happening today, right, in the contemporary scene.